My name is Mardi Rustam, and I'm the producer for Eaten Alive. It was uh, around 75 or 76, there was the movie Jaws came out, and this friend of mine, a writer, he said, I have an idea about alligator. Nobody's done any movies about alligator. Maybe I will uh, do a story about it. I said, would you be interested? I said, yes. And his name was Al Fass. He's done his other scripts before. So he came with a synopsis, and we worked on it, and then expanded to a script called Swamp Beast. And then we tried to find a director. We, I had uh, interviewed two directors, and uh, they were not into horror picture. Then Al Fast, I have to give him credit, he said, you know, Toby Hooper, he just has finished Chainsaw Massacre, it's supposed to be a very good horror movie. Name's Buck. I'm Rand Buck. And he hasn't been to Los Angeles area. Why don't we contact him and make the movie with him and have him do it? Which I said, fine, then we contacted Toby, we, and he came to L.A., and we talked to him. He wanted to see the script, which he did, and he said he has his own writer. He would like to add some other characters to it, uh, somebody by the name of Kim Hinkle. And uh, he added several different characters, uh, especially the Neville Brand ca character. He expanded it. And he was excellent in uh, creating individual characters and giving the proper lines for their character. Then between uh, Al Fast and, and Mr. Hinkle, they came up with the script. And then I had I added several scenes, especially the, the first two scenes was not in the original script. I re requested that to make it more in, exciting to some of the sequences I had to, I just came up with the ideas and incorporated them to the film, especially the first sequence. And, and there were scenes that uh, was not completed. I added some, something to it too. And Toby agreed to it and uh, Toby was ready to go and shoot. Listen, all I want to do is get what I paid for. So you get back in this bed here and you get up on your knees, you hear me? And we scheduled to shoot it for, I believe, 20 days, you know, it was including Saturdays. And I had this cameraman, I have known him as a friend, and he used uh, Robert Caramico, and he was a uh, union cameraman. And he also, was uh, he had just finished the uh, streets of San Francisco, and I believe he was nominated for an Emmy. And I told him to find me somebody a good cameraman. He recommended somebody to help me, help us out. And uh, I usually try to shoot a movie in the middle of the week. I do not start on a Monday because in case if I have any problem with the crew, then I have the whole week to pay for them. You know. And uh, so I started, I believe, on Wednesday. Then by Friday, I didn't get enough shots to make it go on an independent, low-budget film. And even Toby was very disappointed. He said, this guy is very slow, this cameraman. He said, we really have to do something. He said, it's going to take, it's going to take us probably five, six weeks to finish it. So I talked to Robert Caramico, Bob Caramico. I said, I really have a problem with this guy. Is there anybody else? He said, I'll come and shoot it. I said, but you're in a union. He said, don't worry about it. So he came and he was very fast, really, really fast. And uh, this guy easily would have 20 to 25 setups a day or even more. And he was very genius for independent filmmaker for low budget because a lot of times you need a close up and with the regular camera crew, they usually do a long shot and they have another setup. But he would set up the close up and the long shot at the same time. So you'd save a lot of time. 
and uh, he starts shooting for us and frankly he was great then about the second week the union found out about it and I don't know somebody said that uh, he's a union man and the rest of the crew were non-union the only union we had was the Screen Actors Guild so it was like 9 30 10 o'clock in the morning they knocked and they came in two of them asked for Robert he said you know you are a a local union member uh, and so and so and you cannot work and because uh, on a non-union picture because the production company have not signed up with us and he said this is a friend of mine I want to help him out he said well you cannot do that he said who said so he said the law by law calls you you have to be un-union in order to do a non-union non -union picture I swear he took his card out of his wallet he tore it he said here I quit I'm no longer a union member. <laughs> and the guy couldn't believe it. He said, go ahead. He said, I don't want to be a union member. He said, if I can't help my friend here, I don't want to be in that union. But uh, later on, uh, you know, they uh, uh, reinstated because he was a well-known cameraman. I think that everybody did a great job for the set that for any event it looked like a hotel. I mean, it, everything you look at is shot inside the studio. Nothing outside. We had the problem of finding a swamp. And we had looked all over the LA area, we couldn't find it. Then we were going either to uh, Louisiana or Texas to find a swamp to shoot it. Then uh, one of the uh, uh, location, location manager assistant he said there's a studio independent studio right next to Paramount Studios they have a big swimming pool there and they usually usually use it for ocean and things like that maybe we could use that one so we went and looked at it and Toby looked at it he said if we could uh, set it up perfect it was an indoor studio which worked out very well for us and uh, the water was there, so I had a couple of people hired to do all the decoration to make it look like a swamp. And the hotel, everything was built on the studio, which would save us a lot of money by traveling and save us money by being outdoor in case of any problem, anything like that. And we scheduled to shoot it for, I believe, 20 days, you know, it was uh, including Saturdays. Uh, uh, what? Do you have a room? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Actress Roberta Collins. Hello, I'm Roberta Collins, and I had a very good experience acting in this film. I'm not a big fan of horror films, but <laughs> there I was doing my best to be in character. I believe to the best of my knowledge, this is the only horror film I've ever done. I've done some offbeat films. I worked for Jonathan Demme. I was in, I believe, one of his first films, Cage Teeth. I was in a film called The Big Doll House with Pam Greer. So you are seeing my one and only horror film, which was directed by a very fine director, Toby Hooper. We can't move fast, yes, we're in the water. Oh, oh, crap now, not the same. Out on the horse. Oh, oh, upstairs, man, go ahead, go ahead. Neville. My guy, Neville, isn't he adorable? <laughs> My experience with Neville was very interesting because we spent every day together on the set eating honey. He would eat honey out of a big jar and I would sit there and eat it with him. And we were just friends. There was nothing going on. And he invited me to his home for dinner a few weeks later, and I went. 
Uh, he, <laughs> oh, let me see, how do I say this? Um, I, let's just say I felt like I was doing the movie all over again. <laughs> because he made, he had a house on the beach and he made a lovely dinner for me. I knew nothing about his drinking. Uh, I don't even know if I knew he was World War II's uh, most decorated hero at that time. But after dinner, it was very late, and he said, I was welcome to stay there, and don't worry, he's not gonna go near me. So I laid down on the bed next to him with all my clothes on and a parka, and next thing I know, he's screaming at me, saying, no woman lies down beside me without, you know, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and I went, huh? <laughs> and um, then I jumped up, and he comes from behind, and then I'm in the living room, and he turns, and I look, think I'm looking at a combination of a kung fu master, a war hero, <laughs> an actor, and a man that's gonna kill me. <laughs> And he just started to come at me. His eyes changed, everything. And I was so scared that I, I didn't know what was gonna happen. So I, I ran and grabbed my purse and ran out the door and jumped in my car and drove, drove down PCH about 100 miles an hour at three in the morning. <laughs> and um, we never spoke after that, which was, kind of sad because we really liked each other, but, oh God. I do, I do good death scenes. <laughs> I know how to die well. <laughs> and this did gross me out, so I let these blood bags <laughs> freak me and played it for all it was worth. <laughs> I directed basically myself in the sense of the way I played the death scene. I knew they, the board would be there and the blood bags, but when he took that pitchfork and started hitting them, I took it from there. <laughs> just seeing him get sad for me because like I said he I really really liked him and <laughs> you know to have that experience and I'm trying to play it down because when I really get into it my eyeballs pop out <laughs> mm. anyway I, I, I had a great time on the film and and I love Neville. You know, it was just really unfortunate. writer producer Marty Rustam. Before this I used Neville Brand in another movie and he was very very cooperative and uh, he says uh, in the movie Psychic Killer and he would just say you just tell me what you want we'll do it you know and no problem schedule on time perfect timing and very few times you know a retake or third take or fourth take, he was always uh, knew his line and he was always in the key point cue. And I used him after that in two, two other movies. <laughs> we became very close friends. He was a very big hero and was awarded uh, one of the highest uh, purple awards. Really very loyal to his profession, but he just didn't want to be pushed around because uh, he, is, he is American Indian, you know. Yeah, and uh, he just didn't want to be pushed around. 
and he wasn't asking for too much money and very reasonable. And he will tell his agent, said, make the deal. I, I don't care what it is. If they want it, I want to be in that film. But that character was created by Mr. Hinkle. And uh, the, the wording, a lot of it, that was uh, by Neville Brand himself. He was just uh, adding his line, and it went with the character. It was perfect, because he went into the character, and he said, he was telling Toby, don't worry, I, I, I do, I know what I'm doing, I know what you want, I'm going to do And he did. And some of, even some of the decoration in the room, he is the one who created it, Neville did, God bless him. I mean, he had the character, he knew exactly what to do with it, and he would improvise for it, and it just happened to be fit, you know. Sometimes you follow the line, the script supervisor, you know, follows the line, and what is it? Let him do it. <laughs> Let him do what he wants to do. <laughs> Actor William Finley. Hi, this is William Finley. I'm uh, viewing this in a, a New York, trying to figure out what I'm watching exactly, and trying to remember what happened 30 some odd years ago. And they just drove the car on it. The reason I say they drove the car on it is because I wasn't driving the car. I couldn't drive a car very well, and so they just said, uh, well, we'll push you on, we'll push you on stage, and we'll have somebody inside holding down the brakes, and you just steer it. So I did. And that was the beginning of uh, my very strange experience making this movie. You want those stairs there? Yeah. You're turning your right. I uh, got the part, as far as I know, the, the part that I know, or the section I know about how I got the part, is that Toby Hooper, I believe it's seen Phantom, and came over to a set I was working on for a TV show, which was called uh, Last Hours Before Morning. And it was, uh, I was playing a house, a guy working at a hotel as, as a clerk, who uh, <laughs> later turns out to be the killer, even though nobody knew that at the time, including myself. And uh, Toby came on the set and said, uh, are you, are you Finley? Yeah. Hey, I'm Toby Hoover. I made uh, Chainsaw, and I immediately knew who he was, because I was a great fan of uh, Chainsaw, it was a great movie, and said, oh yeah, hi, Mr. Hooper. He said, I got this thing I'm working on, I uh, don't know when it's going to be ready, but I want you to come over and do a part for me, okay? I said, sure, he gave me his number, and that was the beginning of that. It turned out the part was Roy, and uh, I had no idea what Roy was, and I was, was sent a script, and I had no idea who this character was. I've just been told that uh, the producer, one of the producers, said it was written as a mentally challenged person. Well, at the time, I had no idea that it was supposed to be that. It seemed like it just took a couple on the road, but the guy spoke very strangely. And I read the rest of the script, and I realized Oh, I see. There are a couple of people who speak very or act very bizarrely in this film. One of which was Roy, me. The other was Neville Brand. And the third was, I don't remember the name of it, but it, he was a character in a bar who was a, 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 sort of trying to pick a fight in a very odd way, which happens later in the movie. And all three of these characters were very strangely written, like James Joyce almost. And uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't a friend of Toby, and I didn't see him enough before making the movie, so I just decided I was going to do it. Uh, I was going to just go for it and uh, make it as strange a character as I could think of without saying he's mentally incompetent. So I'm thrilled to find out that I was right after all these years, and that what I was doing was not as bizarre as it seemed at the time. 
I don't know exactly where we are now, but I remember working with the dog. The dog was hilarious. It was an adorable, adorable little mutt, and it was, they treated it as if it was the star of the movie. Everybody, Toby, the director, the producer, this, this dog was more important than anybody in this movie. And apparently it had been one of a litter that was a duplicate for Benji. And the owner was, you know, guarded it like it was walking gold, which I'm sure it probably was. Ooh, oh, ooh. I'm just watching Benji or something being devoured in a horrible way. Uh, let's see now. Okay, so we're carrying Kyle up the stairs. And what I remember about Kyle is she was a very interesting little girl because she was pl sort of plunged into this what, what could be seen as a sea of madness because there was a, a wonderful set that they had built for this thing, even though it was very low budget. It was filmed at, I believe it was called Producer's Studio. It might have been called something else. And it was a, basically a low rent but well equipped studio. Uh, somewhere near Paramount. And the, the, the people that worked on this film were a very strange group of people because Toby is, is very good at casting. And he sort of got very good people, but they were all extremely different. And of course, they never worked be together before. And I was used to being in ensemble pieces and things that people had rehearsed over and over and over, and everybody had a really good idea what they were doing. And this poor little girl was put into this den of people who were playing uh, a pill-popping mom, a dad who is seemingly not very effective or effectual in helping people, a madman who um, owns an alligator or a crocodile. And this little girl just sort of seemed like it was okay with her. And what I remember mostly about her is that she was amazing, of an amazing screamer. She had the most ear-splitting scream I've ever heard of any child, including my own son, who's got a pretty good one himself. And all they would do is point at her, and, and Kyle would blast these incredible screams. I sort of, sort of like, I, I had no idea that Marilyn had actually gotten a part of, in the chainsaw because she was the best screamer. And if I didn't realize this was like a qualification for acting, but it turns out that if you watch the movie, as you watch the movie, you'll see an amazing series of screams from this little child. You can't believe what they're coming out of her mouth. Devil's mumbling to himself. Gotta do. What you gotta do. do. I'm working with Toby. Toby, uh, I told you how I got this job. And Toby was not the easiest person to work with because he was very smart, but when he got on the set, he would sort of turn inward and communicate almost through a series of signs until he, you saw him for lunch or you saw him on the side and he would try to explain in a very quick manner what he was trying to do or what was going to happen next or what he thought might happen next. And whenever you brought up worries, he would try to assuage any fears because he said, don't worry, I know this looks very bizarre, but it's going to turn out okay. Don't worry about it. So I didn't. And, and working with him through the years uh, was sort of an amazing experience because we, we worked over, I guess, 25 years on three different movies. And both of us grew as people and had lots of bizarre things happening in our life. And we'd sort of try to catch up with each other. 
and find you know find out what what did happen. Oh, that's really creepy. Now this this whole thing what I'm seeing now is is me doing this very almost obscene gesture to my wife, who's being very nice, right, seemingly. And my interpretation of what I was doing there was I was I was seeing what she was her persona as sort of a spirit that was causing an immense amount of pain to me. It was like she was projecting extremely bad vibes. But of course, in reality, she's not doing anything of the sort. It's just that when she's talking, I think, I think that she's, you know, assaulting me. So I, I'm trying to like choke off, choke off literally her brain. And again, I thought this was way over the top, but Toby thought this this works. This 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 works. Keep doing that. And he's really a great person. But he's always been like a hidden person. It's very, very hard to to get a fix on what he what he's doing at any any moment. Like I tried to talk to him, uh, find out you know whether he was going to do this or try to talk to me into trying to do this commentary. And uh, I just was not successful. I couldn't I couldn't find out where he lived. It's very typical Toby Hooper. In a film like this, I can't explain how strange it was because it's, it was an entire house built on a soundstage with an entire woods, a huge lagoon, a hidden track of like railroad track that this giant beast that somebody had built would roll in and out on as if it were in the water and coming toward you. And they, they had spent a lot of money on this. I mean, and, and they were trying to do Jaws, right? It, quite obviously. But they, like Jaws, they couldn't get this crocodile to work. They could hardly get it to move on the tracks, let alone look like it was a real living thing or even open its mouth. Everything was like impossible. It was like, when I first saw it, I said, oh, this is going to be amazing. It's going to be like Jaws. It's going to leap up. It's going to, you know, devour people in an amazing way. And it's going to be, scare the hell out of everybody. Well, everybody found out that, you know, the, the Jaws never worked. And neither did this. It just never worked. It was like this lead weight that would just drag the production down. Well, Brand six, top of the stairs, right there. They got Neville Brand. Now Neville Brand wasn't a known, a known name for motion picture audiences, but he was a, a top talent. And people, if they knew him, knew him from TV, where he played an assortment of gangsters, and was really quite well known on TV. But if you said the name Neville Brand, no one would know what you mean, or very few, except people in the business. So Neville's like one kind of star, and then they got what now has become called stunt casting, made very famous by Quentin Tarantino. But before that, it was Man Man World and multiple other pictures around the world, Lady Days, and of course, things were much lower budget. But Tubby was early on in this idea, and he got really very well-known people to do small roles. So they got Mel Ferrer, he got uh, Carolyn Jones, a very well-known person, actress, um, Stuart Whitman, all people you could put on a poster and sort of know who they were. You know, like, this is an okay movie to go see. Even though it looks like it might be very cheap and scary, it's, it's okay to go see this. It's got these people in it. It must be. It couldn't be that bad. So that was very smart casting, and I thought he was sort of early on in doing this, and of course at a very much more inexpensive level than the other people were, the other studios. Neville. Now Neville was wonderful because he would. He would, He was very scary. He. Nobody knew what to expect from him. 
he would be basically shut up in this dressing room. And Toby would go breezing in and breezing out and slam the door, and nobody was allowed to talk to him, really, unless he wanted to talk to whoever. And I kept getting, I never met him until I worked with him. And I kept getting these reports from Toby and, and Marilyn and some of the girls who were working on the set that he was sort of really scary and physical and doing that weird stuff with the girls. And they were really very afraid of him. So by the time I got to work with him, she looks great in the wig. She's fabulous. By the time I got to work with him, I was pretty scared of what to expect. Because, of course, the only the, my main scene with him was going to be a fight scene. <laughs> okay. So this part... I had no idea what this meant about my eye, my eye. And I asked Toby, and he said, well, I, I'm not sure either, but I don't even know how to play this bill. But Kim had some idea, the, the, the writer. Kim had some idea that you, you were, maybe you've actually lost an eye somewhere. And I said, this is, really? He said, I don't know what to make of that. It makes no sense to me either, but why, why don't you try that? We try a couple different ways. So he he seemed to go for this idea of actually looking for the eye under the bed, on the floor, and in the rug. So I went with it. I said, OK, fine, let's, let's try that. And we did it. And I, I was like acting up, you know, it was like acting in an airplane hangar because I was, although it looks like a tiny room or not, not a very big room, it, it was in this giant studio. And, Every time you said something, the walls would reverberate. So they literally had to muffle the top of the set at some point. So as you could, I could still be intense, but they could not, they wouldn't get a, a really odd and ear shattering echo. What was intense about it is if you, of course, like all movies, you sit around doing nothing. And then suddenly, bang, you have to get up and uh, be rolling around looking for your eyeball on a set, and the, you're sort of in a void. You don't know exactly whether any of this is working. Everybody's sort of watching, including your other actors, saying, what is he doing? Marilyn was sort of fascinated with, with how over the top this was and how interesting it was. And we would joke about it during, during uh, waiting for the next take. So after a while, we got very used to what to expect from each other. Oh, huh? Can't pretend it never happened. What? What? Oh, sir, sir, got no all this. Okay, so Roy is really pissed now. Really angry. This is the scene I was dreading because I, they had stunt workers, they had fight choreographers. They were in rehearsals. These guys were like beating the shit out of each other, and I said. What, I'm going to do this with this guy? I mean, of course, Neville wasn't involved. There were two guys who were, who were stunt coordinators fighting each other, and Neville was off sort of not watching, and I was off watching very carefully to find out what they wanted us to do. And although in the movie it doesn't look like much is happening, there's a section, tiny brief section, that when we shot it was really more extensive. It was a shoving match, a slight fist fight, ducking, weaving, and none of it was used. But all of it was scary, because I, I didn't know what, what Neville was going to do, or whether he could pull a punch, or even knew what he was up to. So you had a man, me, who was trying to act like he was mentally unstable, and you had another man who may have been mentally unstable, or it might have just been an act for all I know. No idea. Now, here we here we go with the the croc that can't do anything. Then we have the insert shot, which I think is too much, too much blood, too much stuff. We have dying, 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 dying. Neville doing a wonderful job of having a good time. And 
That's the thing that took him years to do. Just that, the prop going through the fake railing and getting me. The croc wouldn't move, the croc, they couldn't push the croc, it was too heavy. The croc would fall into the water. <laughs> they finally got it to work and the, got the mouth to open and, and I just basically threw myself into the mouth and pretended that the croc was biting me. But the croc, the mouth wouldn't close. Oh. Co-writer, producer, Marty Rustum. We had some problem with the alligator and we went to L.A. Zoo, and uh, I had the cameraman and everything. We made the range, and we gave him, you know, we had the permit to shoot at the zoo. They have a lot of crocodile and alligator. I am telling you, this was in the month of uh, May. These alligators wouldn't move, no matter what. We, and we started hey, giving them a stick or something, you know, just to you know, open their jaws, you know, or, or do something. So it would be exciting for the film. Absolutely nothing. So I, we talked to one of the attendants there. She said the only th way they could make a move or even get something going, either throw them meat or pour very cold water, extremely cold water or extremely hot water. And we didn't have any meat with this. And, but the guy said, I'll bring some meat. So he brought some meat. It still didn't, they, what all they do is just move a little bit. So we pour, poured hot water and cold water on them. And we then we start getting some action from them. Then we had a couple of guys recommended that they would build us a, you know, phony alligators. And that didn't work. And we are coming close to the production uh, shooting schedule. We had to shoot on a certain date because the studio was booked for the television season was coming back in coming in uh, July. So we had a deadline to finish. So a friend of mine from Universal, which he had helped me to do my other movie, the uh, second movie, Psychic Killer, and uh, the guy, who, the man who directed uh, Ray Danton, and he knew everybody at Universal. And, uh, he made contact for me to find out who ha was the person who did Jaws. You know, the, so he found out and there was a guy who lived in Sun Valley. So we got hold of him and he said, no problem. And uh, we went to his backyard. It was full of different animals, alligators. So we chose about three of them and uh, they were all worked out very well for us. But what we had to do is have somebody under water swimmer so it could move the alligators around put the alligator open the alligator's mouth and all that dude. so if you look at the alligator scenes most of them are artificial but there are a couple of shots when they just they see the alligator going like this that's a real alligator from the zoo well my name is craig reardon i'm a makeup artist uh, but I wasn't one officially, really, when I uh, had the opportunity to work on this movie. And the man called me up, and um, he, uh, he introduced himself briefly and said, we've got a movie here, and uh, it's being directed by Toby Hooper. And he let, let a little pause for dramatic effect. Well, I'd never heard of Toby, you know, at that point in my life. And uh, I said, uh, who's Toby Hooper? And he said, Toby Hooper. He directed Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I'd never heard of that either. <laughs> so I, you know, I mean, I, I couldn't help it. I'd, I'd never heard of the movie yet, nor Toby, but you know, obviously there, there was more Toby Hooper in my future. I just didn't know it yet. So I, I couldn't, you know, I had the defect of honesty. I said, well, all right, fine. And he said, well, he seemed a little uh, nonplussed, but he said, uh, well, it's for two weeks, and we've got a guy, and he's not quite working out. So we and he and he offered his terms, which was I think I think the munificent sum of about three hundred bucks a week, and I'm not kidding. But uh, you know, with the rest deferred, and I don't even remember what the uh, chicken shit uh, offer was. But you know, I'll tell you what, the, the uh, opportunity to be launched by the seat of your pants into an actual movie. Uh, in retrospect, was sensational, not ideal in so far as that you're stepping right into something that is, first of all, 
very, very modestly budgeted, and already in progress. And they had a couple of things they yet needed to do that were, um, you know, rather uh, uh, ambitious. They had a couple of murders on the slate, etc. Well, what happened was I came in here, and the uh, young makeup man, whose name was Frank Gluck, uh, who has since passed away, but Frank, uh, he had a lot of pluck, and he, he wasn't going to get himself fired. And he, he kind of BS'd them and said, well, you can't bring anybody else in. They won't be able to uh, match the makeups I've done on the women, which is highly debatable. But <laughs> somehow or other, he swayed them. Co-writer, producer, Marty Rustam. Now, this is on the second floor of the hotel, or the motel. I look I like that. <laughs> they kicked <laughs> That was his own doing, by the way. It was not in the script. <laughs> now, th this is, uh, th this scene was from uh, Henkel. He's the one who created it. And if you talk to people about, say, ho Toby's films, of course, number one is Chainsaw Massacre. And the number two, they talk about Poltergeist. And number three is this category. And Toby's done a lot of movies. You know, it's not only four or five. He's done a lot of movies. There are movies, the timing is wrong for it. Later on comes on, it's, it's, people make comparison, you know. And I just, uh, I think it's a good movie. Maybe it's self-serving, but. <laughs> <laughs> Actress, Kyle Richards. Hey there, I'm Kyle Richards, and I played Angie in Eaten Alive. And there I am, oh my gosh, I think that was the audition screen. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine seeing your mother being wrapped in a bag like this with a rope? I mean, look at this, I cannot believe I have to, oh my gosh. Oh my God. See, that was not acting. That was a real fear. I had never seen anything like this, and I'd never seen a man like that. <laughs> and I felt like he was going to kill me. I remember what I forgot about the brace on my leg. That was so uncomfortable. <laughs> now, there, this was the, imagine, I, don't, I really don't know what my mother was thinking, <laughs> letting me do this film, but this was horrifying. I will never get over that image. Never. Oh my gosh. Now, I'm, oh my, I'm running with the, I wanted to run faster because I really felt like he was gonna kill me. Makeup artist, Craig Reardon. Uh, Marilyn was very sweet and there was Toby's girlfriend, I believe, at that time. And uh, she had a scream that would, you know, that would have brought down, you know, the walls of Jericho. And uh, by this time, this camera guy is directing this scene, Toby having, you know, flipped him the finger, and I guess, and, and, you know, there was something that happened there. Something soured, and he was gone. So the cameraman is calling the shots, and he gets what he wants, and uh, Marilyn has got this supersonic scream going. And, I mean, it is like a fire engine siren. And uh, he says, I cut, with his New York accent. And she doesn't hear him at all. Plus, she's a bit methody. She's really committed to screaming her heart out. He said, cut! She's still, ah! Ah! He said, cut, 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 damn it, cut! So, <laughs> so finally she, uh, oh, <laughs> you know, out, cuts off the screen. <laughs> so that was, uh, you know, how some of those things were filmed. Mm. This, the set that you see through most of the film, well, and let me tell you what it was like to go there. A producer's studio uh, was basically a rental lot, as I understand it, and um, the American International Company, for example, in the early 60s had made a lot of their, I believe I am correct in stating this, made a lot of their most famous films there, everything from How to Make a Monster up through the Edgar Allan Poe pictures, when they needed you know, actual sound stages and studio-type facilities. And in fact, I think you can see producers in How to Make a Monster, when they amble about the lot, I think you're looking at Producer's Studio. 
And today it occupies the property across from uh, the east end of Paramount Studio that's now called Raleigh Studios. Go in there and pull it out. Uh, Neville was a fascinating character. Neville had had an alcohol problem in his life, but he was past that point. And he uh, had been kind of heavy. I remember seeing him on a very entertaining show made at Universal about uh, three dudes in the West called uh, Laredo. Laredo, that's what it was called with a, a guy who became another genre uh, star named William Smith and a man named Peter Brown and Neville Brand. And Neville, I believe, uh, God bless his memory, because he was a very intelligent, interesting man, and I have some more to say about it, but I do believe that he was kind of on the sauce in those days. And I had heard that he had a little incident where he, you know, in kind of giggling contempt, had gone up to one of the Universal trams and relieved himself on it. <laughs> That, not the kind of photo op that Universal would have preferred from its uh, contract stars. And, you know, get him out of here, you know. Well, anyway, he had uh, uh, had a very interesting career and had done some beautiful work in films like, uh, I think there was one called Halls of Montezuma, where he had some excellent scenes. And uh, I also remember him in uh, Starlight uh, 13, uh, Billy Wilder's film. A fine actor. And he had actually credited acting uh, with sort of saving his mind because he was i think i'm correct in saying the second most decorated soldier in world war ii after audie murphy and like audie murphy he found a way to kind of work through the, the trauma of that uh through acting and in neville's case in particular i think it helped him as a therapy literally helped save his you know his emotions and I found Neville to be a wonderful, uh, fascinating guy to just hang out and listen. He loved to talk. And every morning he would be chattering. He loved pretty girls, so he'd love to, you know, get one of the girls, one of the wardrobe girls or whatever, and just, you know, keep her spellbound. So Neville was a, a humorous person and a, a person of great charisma. And I, I think he was just winging it. I, I, you know, I don't, I never really saw a script for this film. So, so. It, it, it's my impression, also seeing some of the scenes again from the film, that a great deal of what Neville did was uh, improvised. And he inhabited this guy. I, d I don't know what his acting background was. I don't know if he went through Actors Studio or what the hell, but he was, to that extent, the kind of actor who, when he was doing it, was in the head of that guy. And, uh, and, and great enthusiasm, too. You know, he didn't hold back. Actress. Kyle Richards. This is where I crawled under and they wanted to put me in with live rats. And um, I think my mom had already seen me going over the edge at that point. So she had had the makeup artist who was a petite woman. They had, she had them squeeze her into my wardrobe. They had an extra dress, I guess, and go in there for me because I could not be in with the rats. The man and the sickle was enough. <laughs> They said the, that there are trained rats and you go in there. And then my mom said, that's where I draw the line. And she looked at the makeup artist and thought, she'll be perfect for this. <laughs> and we're lucky that she agreed to do that. And you know, when you're filming, you always have like three of the same clothes in case they get dirty or whatever. So I guess they had a little bit bigger size and they squeezed her in. And she went in with a long wig on. It felt like everybody was like a, you know, a method actor. Like everybody was so under their role that I, you know, that they were, I just remember that. There wasn't, I don't remember like cut and people talking and laughing. No, it didn't feel like that at all. It felt like people were into their thing and that was it. I felt like that was, those were really my parents and I did not like that feeling. Talking about. Uh, yeah, I think I was thinking, maybe I don't want to be an actress anymore. Because I know that usually on a set, everybody's so friendly, you know, the directors, the actors, everybody's like looking out for you and you know, you know, you, you have your parents and your teacher on the set, but this is just, no matter who's looking out for you, it's just too disturbing to be in that situation. And I like scary movies, but it's scary. It's like beyond scary. I like jumping out of your seat scary, but this like, I don't know, it's mentally disturbing. <laughs> you would. Now why don't you take your old daddy back to the hotel and get him home? Co-writer, producer, Marty Rustam. Mel Ferrer, I think he was between pictures, and uh, we tried to get something, a different class of uh, actor. We didn't want it to be all from the South or something like that. And, and the uh, casting director said, I could get you Mel Ferrer, a very good, reasonable 
rate and also he's available within that period that you're looking for. I said, my gosh, Mel Ferrer, you know, would add a different dimension to the picture because he's not uh, a regular servant actor, cowboy actor. And, and he, he was perfect. He really was. He's, he's the director's dream. I mean, he knew exact line, exact step. He knew exactly where to step. If he took a second take, third take, it's almost the same. But for security reasons, uh, sometimes uh, the director will take more than one, sh you know, one take just to make sure that the scene is there because it isn't like today's web digital. They look at it, there. you have to wait for next day to look at the dailies, see if it came out okay or not. I think I had two people who did the casting for me, and I had uh, the lady who was on my right hand person, Julie. She would make all the arrangements. She would say, I think this is good, and I would listen to her. And then we present it to Toby, and Toby would look at it, and he would say, okay, I'll go with this instead of this. Like that we had, uh, I don't want to mention her name, one actress to do a scene in the bedroom, take her shirt off, show her breast, uh, and, the, uh, and she didn't want to do it. And so Toby said, I don't want, then in that period, I don't want to. And he, he told me later, I said, I don't want to bring you somebody else. He said, because that means a lot to, to the character. What he was aiming at the character, that means the girl is lonely. You know, she didn't need love. That's why she falls in love with the Stuart Whitman. He said, I needed that, not to show that she's just coming with her father. They want to have some, something like she is really lonesome. She doesn't have anybody, and so she could fall in love with the uh, Stuart Whitman. Makeup artist Craig Reardon. The madam of the whorehouse was none other than Carolyn Jones, who I ad adored as, uh, you know, Morticia Adams on the TV Adams Family, of course. I uh, was given to understand had to be a very old and unattractive madam. And then again, uh, there again, you know, uh, the makeup man that would not leave, you know, just basically put a hell of a lot of rubber on her face. So she came in. I thought it was a, a somewhat disappointing looking, but, uh, you know, it, it it worked out okay. Oh, there's, there's Carolyn. God bless her. I don't know how old she was then, and, you know, that's hardly germane, but... Uh, to a young man, uh, she still seemed very attractive to me, and I was smitten with her a little bit. Because she was so friendly and talked to all the crew people very openly, very charming. I believe she had been married to none other than Aaron Spelling when she was a younger woman. But at any rate, I, uh, I remember distinctly after she was done shooting her scenes, I uh, offered to escort her out to the parking lot. <laughs> and, uh, and so I did escort Carolyn out to the parking lot, and uh, I felt, uh, you know, uh, quite the gentleman, you know. It was very gratifying to be able to <laughs> pretend to, uh, you know, be her, her knight in shining armor. And she was so sweet. I don't think she was there more than a day or two. Uh, and of course, uh, there were other uh, great Hollywood people in this cast. Uh, Mel Ferrer, you know, who was uh, very quiet. He sat outside in his dressing room, which was a very kind of unattractive, you know, old-fashioned kind of trailer outside. They didn't, they simply obviously didn't have oodles of money to spend on this. And uh, I was not, at that time in my life, at the age of 23, as fully familiar with Mel Ferrer's career as I later became. And uh, it, it, these are interesting lessons to learn when you yourself are starting out, that a person who, you know, had been in major, major expensive MGM film productions, and I later learned had been a prominent TV and stage director, you know, would come and do this very, very, very low budget uh, little thriller. But, uh, you know, certainly when you're young, you think, oh, look what he's come to. Listen, you know, when you get older, you, you, that turns around. It kind of does a 180 because uh, life is a, uh, a humbling experience in some ways. You find that you, too, are cap fully capable of having ups and downs in your life. And you uh, come to appreciate the courage, as it were, of uh, professionals who are able to adjust, of necessity sometimes, to a different kind of opportunity and still give it the same, absolutely the same degree of professionalism and, uh, you know, uh, uh, every inch of creative effort. 
that they would have done when they were, you know, working for MGM in its, in its salad days when it did beautiful films like, well, Mel was in films like Lily, a beautiful musical, and Knights of the Round Table. I mean, huge, huge stuff. You got something for you. Look, look here. Actress Kyle Richards. Imagine when you're a child filming with somebody who has the scary face and voice. I don't mean to be me, but he gave me nightmares for a long time. It was it wasn't your usual, you know, set where there's you know more action. It was kind of a solemn, dark feeling around the whole thing, which is why it was so disturbing to me, and why I developed my little nervous twitch after filming this movie. <laughs> this was really scary being under there in the dirt. You know, there could be spiders. <laughs> I see fake spider webs, but they were real to me. It was just so easy to be scared and imagine. Oh my God, oh my gosh. That is, <laughs> oh yeah, I remember that. Yeah, you know, like I said, I've done so many scary films and I was never scared while filming it. But this, the images and everything surrounding it were so disturbing to me. I mean, I cannot imagine why I look at this. <laughs> I mean, it really, really flipped me out. And I, I developed a nervous twitch while I was filming this. And my mom had to go to the director and say, we, we have to keep an eye on her. She's been acting a little strange and, you know, she's like, twitching and you know and now I can look back and know exactly why because I went on to do other horror films after this but like I said they never bothered me like that I didn't even know Halloween was a scary movie until I saw myself in it that said it was like you know there was other kids and you know I would be playing cards with Michael Myers and you know hanging out we were laughing and Jamie Lee Curtis is the sweetest person alive <laughs> and you know we were just having fun and then you know that felt like just playing that which usually acting felt like to me as a child just playing and you know but this really was living like a nightmare I mean that was what I was doing every day that is not what your average six-year-old child is doing I wasn't you know you know swinging on swings and uh, coloring with my friends so that was very very strange Makeup artist, Craig Reardon. Oh, here's Mel about to get it. Now, I was pushed out of this. Frank Gluck was going to do whatever he was going to do. And it took about, I don't know, five days for him to put this makeup on. Finally, uh, Mel comes back onto the stage. And what Mr. Gluck has done, it looks to me like, is taken uh, uh, mortician's wax, which is, a, you know, a... Uh, Pretty good for doing little, little, you know, alterations. Maybe the bridge of a nose, or a little, uh, uh, you know, maybe a little a cut or something. You know, it's a very malleable, sticky wax, and uh, it, it derived its name from its use from actual morticians taking corpses and reconstruction. Very limited at this point in film history as far as its uh, utility for film, simply because it's very vulnerable, and you know, you don't want to use it for anything too extensive. Well, Frank goes and uses about five pounds of it under the guy's chin. I mean, it was a, a, a miracle it didn't fall off. And, and Mel is practically doing the limbo to get to the set without this giant chunk of wax falling off his neck. This is to represent, obviously, his own neck. And there is some kind of a sh something in there that the blade can fit through, you know, the blade of the actual prop side. So poor Mel, you know, very serious expression on his face. I, it, in retrospect, it surprises me he wasn't cracking up or, uh, you know, very angry. He, I think he was a little angry. <laughs> he did. He was going through it. And they got him to the set. All right, okay. You know, that was all. <laughs> you know, the eyes saying, shoot, shoot it, shoot it, you know. And uh, Toby was still directing at this point and needed or wanted to have blood pour out of his mouth. So Frank, you know, uh, hands me, uh, yeah, I made a good fall guy for Frank Gluck, so he hands me the blood, and I'm standing there with the blood. The moment arrives, and, you know, 
before, uh, you know, Mel Ferrer has to take a big slug of this blood and hold it in his mouth. And then, you know, action, and they pull the blade out, at least anyway, the blood comes out. Well, you know, Ferrer is gagging, you know, and uh, <laughs> Toby says, is this okay to put in the mouth, you know? Toby's a wonderful, sweet guy, and he's got this great Texas accent. And uh, Frank says, did you give him the blood that was the body blood? <laughs> I'm thinking, you son of a bitch. <laughs> you handed me the blood. But, you know, I didn't, uh, I didn't get confrontational back then. So basically, <laughs> you know, with, uh, you know, six pairs of eyes staring at me like you, you rotten mongrel. You know, you tried to kill Mel Ferrer. But Mel recovered with a little water, you know, a little water gargle. I must say, this video uh, transfer looks beautiful. Uh, the print I saw at that time looked grainy and rather, you know, it was kind of distressing because it had a, a, a not a very good look in, it, in the screen that I saw back then. I believe they showed it at the Writers Guild Theater, which at that time was on Melrose. Being a, you know, a big retard and not having a girlfriend at the time, I think I brought my mom, my dear mom, or somebody, or, you know, some, somebody to come see this thing. And looked at the credits. I think the credits rolled at the end, I can't recall. But having sat through this uh, film, which seemed like the, epi you know, the epitome of, uh, <laughs> you know, of, of, of wild and crazy vulgarity and, you know, just, you know, seat of your pants filmmaking. And then to see the credits roll and see makeup, Craig Reardon, I kind of turned to my mom or whoever it was and said, I, I, yeah, listen, I didn't do a thing <laughs> like I wanted to disassociate myself. And uh, that is simply a symptom of youth. You know, you don't have anything else up out there yet. Never would I have dreamt, however, that I would be sitting on the couch here in 2006 with you, David, and speak, you know, talking about, uh, you know, what is that again? Uh, eating alive. <laughs> I swear to God, I think it had about three or four sounds. Uh, and it's, uh, yeah, you know, I have a great affection for the experience. And I tell you what, you know, you, you, you see a film made like this, and you will learn, you know, filmmaking. Uh, the, I guess the point is that you start off in uh, a film career having been a film fan, a priori. And then you get in, you see how they're really made, and it's a constant uh, eye-opener. You know, oh my God, so that's all gee whiz, you know. And, uh, you're bound to learn something. Robert England, I'd like to say a couple things about. Robert, uh, I remember one day he said something like, well, I'm not going to be a star with this big, uh, what did he, uh, he referred to his nose as this big uh, hooter of mine or something. And that, that really kind of, uh, uh, in some ways, uh, indicates his sense of realism and uh, humor and enthusiasm. He was very bright and uh, very enthused. I mean, this guy was just radiating energy all the time and seemed to be having the time of his life there. And uh, to whatever extent, uh, you know, that comes across in his portrayal as Buck and in his, you know, later work as Freddy, it was already there, believe me. There was uh, another scene where he came in and this pretty young girl was playing a prostitute and he uttered the immortal line, which I'm sure everybody that enjoys this film can w quote, which is, uh, my name's Buck and I'm here to fuck. Well, I was standing and witnessed that great scene. Co-writer, producer, Marty Rustam. But when he first came in and he looked like he had the southern accent and everything and and Toby wanted to use you know, to put him in the movie and I said, Are you sure he hasn't done anything? So no, you're good, don't worry about it. I said, Well it's up to you and uh, talked about it and I met with the Robert and I felt like he was uh, very sincere and he was uh, ready to you know be part of the project and Toby liked him and I said perfect of course Robert from there has been gone to a lot of other movies you know he's been Freddy <laughs> uh, this scene was not shot on the studio I just remember that this was shot in a nightclub we shot this uh, after the movie was over, we shot in the night for this was set for we shot in one night. The original title was Swamp Beast and uh, I had one distributor, J 
changed the title to Death Trap. He said, that's the best title. And then the, there was a play by the name of Death Trap, and uh, Warner Brothers, uh, of course, Warner Brothers was going to make a movie out of it. Eventually they did. And they had, they had copyrighted it with the MPAA, which we didn't. But then we came to an agreement to have their death trap, one word, ours is two words. But then he changed the survey that somebody else paid me up front and other the survey they said, I think they could make more money out of it by changing the name from death trap to something else, which they did to eat my life. Then one of my partners in the film, he had the right for the film uh, if I if I didn't gross that m so much money, but it was grossing, we're making a lot of profit. Then he persuaded me that I have a distributor in the south. He's willing to pay us up front, providing we agree to change the title again. I said, Oh my God! Fortunately, I mean, fortunately or unfortunately, whatever it is, that period of it was like a year and a half. Those days there was no VHS machine, or anything like that, so it just had to bring it to the theater. They would change the title. Then I, finally I took I took it back, the whole product, and I just went back to Eaton Alive and stayed with that one. Yeah, was that All right, all right. I played in New York, did very well in New York, matter of fact, and I played in the South of Florida as well. Played, of course, in Texas, and we had uh, two companies have taken different areas. One was the Clark distribution in the south, and the other one was Aquarius back east, the Aquarius distribution. And I, American International Pictures, I, if you know their name from the past, they were very much interested. But we couldn't come up with a price that will make the investors happy, because they were coming up with the just cost of the picture and then you know, and they had to recover their money back, interest, and all that. It just uh, wasn't good enough for us. It did get good play, but it did not do like what we were expecting. We were thought, you know, we would easily would make over a million dollars, but didn't. But we covered uh, all our expenses and uh, returned. I think it was like uh, after six months in uh, distribution, we we made good money out of it. It's ironic, uh, but four or five years later, we made as much money out of the movie that we did when we first released it. I still, right now, almost every year, I will have maybe four or five countries they're licensing expires, they renew it, they almost pay, not as much as they paid originally, but more than 20% less, or, you know, which is very, very lucrative and proud, profitable. Worldwide, uh, what happened, before shooting the picture, I had contacted uh, through, my, I had an agent, through the agent, had contacted about uh, three territories which we told them we were going to shoot this movie, or, and uh, we sent them the synopsis. And uh, they gave me advance against the picture. So there were three ter territories were or, or already sold at the time we were start shooting, was uh, German, England, and Japan. Makeup artist Craig Reardon, and uh, and I'm looking up there and I'm seeing uh, Stuart Whitman. And Stuart Whitman had been in uh, some films I loved. I'd saw seen with my parents as a kid. Uh, notably, I'm thinking uh, John Wayne's film, The Comancheros. And here were these guys in this. Uh, you know, you might have what, I, and I did probably when I was young say this crappy little horror film. But hey, you know, I wanted to be a makeup artist for crappy little horror films. I loved crappy little horror films. I grew up, you know. Loving the Wolfman and the, not the not necessarily even the original fine films that Universal did, but the later lousy sequels. It it, it all you know, 
it's all a world that it, I don't have to, I'm preaching to the choir to tell the people that are listening to this track, you know, that these are the films we love. And Mel and uh, Neville and uh, Carolyn, none of, none of these wonderful actors and Stuart did not play down to this. They absolutely did their, did their best and uh, lent it, uh, you know, a distinction that made them worth their hire. And uh, so that was, a, that was a revelation to me. I think I'm looking right now at the lady whose breasts I made up. My greatest value, perhaps, to uh, speaking about this film is as a fascinated eyewitness for two weeks. However, I did not do any makeup whatsoever on this movie, except <laughs> I made up a very cute young lady for a scene in a whorehouse, a young extra. And then there was one momentous day where Frank had gone to lunch and said, no, I'm leaving the set with you, and if anybody calls for makeup, it's your job. And he disappeared for about an hour. And sure as hell, makeup! I heard from our set, and, uh, and more about the set in a bit. And I said, oh my God, oh Jesus, oh. And I grabbed, uh, you know, my little kit and ran in there and, uh, you know, appeared on the set. At this point in the film, which had a tumultuous two-week, uh, you know, process while I was there, uh, there was, the director of photography was directing this particular scene. Toby Hooper at this point had had a disagreement and had quit, I think. He, he wasn't there anyway. And this guy uh, is there behind the camera, operating the camera and, and quasi-directing, and uh, he says, he points, he says, there, go over there. And uh, there's, there's Bob England, kind of half straddling this half-naked girl. <laughs> so I said, uh, Okay, what seems to be the problem? He says, I need you to, you know, yeah, you need to, uh, you know, uh, match, match her body, you know, to, to her face. And I, I, I remember saying something like, you mean, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> like, oh, like the, the young innocent I was. And he said, and I looked at him kind of blankly, he said, make up her tits. I said, I, what, what's wrong with them? They're the wrong color, they're too light, you know. And he yelled, shouting, even though he's about three feet away from me. So I says, okay, right. And I said, I'll be right back. And I, <laughs> I got like something out of uh, Looney Tunes, went off in a puff of smoke, back to the table outside the set, rummaged around, oh, yeah, what have I got here? Well, found a couple of pancake makeup things that I, thank God, brought, grabbed a sponge and some water, and, you know, ran back in there. And I, trying to keep a very dignified kind of <laughs> bedside manner, walked over to this young beauty. And, uh, you know, she was uh, bare-chested. And uh, so I started dabbing, uh, you know, the makeup on her breasts. <laughs> you know, as straight-faced as I could. And she looked up at me and went, <laughs> well, I kept a straight face. I was very serious about my job. And I looked over at this, uh, this guy and I said, uh, how's that look? And he said, good, get out of there. <laughs> Waving his head. I said, all right. I got off the set and walked back out, and it wasn't that I didn't have a sense of humor, but I, I was literally kind of in a state of shock, you know. <laughs> so I, I'd never put makeup on a woman's breast before. I also would like to say, with uh, due respect to these beauties that were in this film, that I am in no way uh, derogating their beautiful figures or faces. They were very nice and. Uh, you know, what is a, what is a good uh, horror exploitation film without a sexy girl in it? You know, we had at least a couple of them. And the credits for Tame in the West. Co-writer, producer, Marty Rustam. We wanted to have it relate the sexual part to make Judd more mad. Because he, like the religious part of him comes in. He would not like that to happen in his room, in his the hotel. And this, as far as the nudity, you know, it was uh, the, the, the topless. Uh, that was uh, either the writer or and we discussed it and we thought it would be a good uh, element to add to it and create more of a anger from Judd to see what's going on in the room. You could have done it without the nudity, but I think uh, for some reason it worked. Uh, the way he analyzed and the way it's uh, created by Al and Al, Al Fass and Henkel was uh, in his youngsters, he's not been properly brought up and it was abused and this hotel was given to him and uh, 
his parent has been punished by the government and he wanted to kind of indirectly had a revenge factor in his mind. So any, any human being, he would not get along with, especially if they are sinners. Sometimes he would play three characters. He played the nice guy, then they played the very religious person, and then they played the, that he was a victim and he's out for revenge. Most of the time we let the actors, actresses have developed their own background based on the character they portray portraying, because that way they will be more comfortable with it instead of telling you, oh, I have to do this and this and this, you know. Personally, ne Neville, uh, deep inside, he had a lot of anger against the government. And uh, he was supposed to receive the award, but he, he was given the award, but he never, they never gave it to him officially because he never made it uh, to the White House. Uh, Something happened on the train, and uh, I just wanted it to be a, for publication, really. Yeah, and uh, he was telling me about it, what happened. And he just felt he served the country more than an average person, which he did. And but he was not treated properly toward the end. Makeup artist, Craig Reardon. I remember also a day where somebody had to go in the dreaded al alligator uh, pond. Well, this thing was about, I don't know, four by four or five by five. You know, I mean, you li were lucky to get the guy in there, let alone with the rubber alligator. And uh, Bob Natty, of all people in the world, the man who is associated uh, in film fan history with having uh, gaffed the, uh, the uh, giant squid from 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, I kept being hearing this is Bob, you know, Bob Maddy provided this alligator. Well, uh, you know, with all due respect to Mr. Maddy and the beautiful squid from 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, this alligator looked like, uh, you know, uh, an ironing board, you know. I mean, it wasn't the greatest alligator I ever saw in my life, but uh, it was a lot of fun to see it work. And I remember particularly where Bob England has to, uh, we might say eat it, but the alligator's gonna eat him. And he hits the pond and, uh, I'd never heard of Bob England, and he, of course, never heard of me either, but uh, when Bob hit the water, he was acting his ass off, and, ah, and it was a hell of a lot like, you know, uh, Tim Burton's movie with, uh, you know, uh, uh, Martin Landau as Bailey Pelsey, you know, really having to feed himself into that alligator. Ah, your arm's good. With the arm and the jaws, and, you know, and the guy outside the, uh, you know, five by five pond pumping with the uh, Hudson sprayer with the blood gurk, a gurk, a gurk, and, you know, and expiring as he basically had to crouch to get into the level of the water. So this was, this was a kick in the pants, you know, to see these uh, scenes of unmitigated horror, you know. And uh, then, of course, stand up to his full height and be about at, you know, mid, mid thigh height in this pond of death. The rubber alligator got to take five, you know. I also want to portray uh, the emotions that I felt in this one soundstage for two weeks, and particularly when they got to the short strokes towards the end, uh, it, the pace began to accelerate at a kind of frantic level. And as I uh, mentioned, there would be little, little bitty units, guys with uh, cameras on their shoulders. Uh, this was before the invention of the super sophisticated steady cam, which is a whole different ball of wax where you have a counterbalanced you know, you have this ultimate smoothness. These were like Aeroflex type cameras and they were doing rough and ready, you know, coverage. And I, <laughs> I remember they had these trees set up in a sort of staggered thing in pots or something, or with T type, you know, wood stands. And they had this poor little gal running through it, you know, with her bits falling out, screaming, you know, Aah! and then, you know, two beats and then Neville Rah! was coming behind her, you know, swinging his uh, side. And then turn around, do it the other direction. Aah! You know, he's after it again. And it really is quite, you know, you really risible, but, it, but great. You know, this, this was filmmaking, man. And, they, and then the guy would turn over, and I remember they had to do an insert of, uh, I think, some bloody foam in this, in this tank. And, and this funny-ass uh, cameraman would be, you know, running commentary as he played. Okay, and I'll see the hand go down at the far. That's beautiful. Okay. And he's, he's doing his own focus. He says, Hey, we zoom in into the fucking bloody fall. Great, terrific. I cut you. Know. 
<laughs> it, it was kind of circus-like, but there was a bit of a carnival atmosphere, you know, I mean, a little bit of a, you know, the people, I felt like the least worldly person on the set. I think I was right about that in retrospect. But, you know, uh, young people working in, in the film business, I've since discovered, throw up a mask out of insecurity of kind of nonchalance and bored with everything, you know. They don't want to let on that they're, you know, the new kid on the block. Well, you know, when you're looking for someone to identify with and everybody's just dragging on a cigarette, you know, well, you know how it is. You know, <laughs> and they're like, Jesus Christ, you know. And I do remember one amazing thing on the film, which I'll, I won't dwell on too long, but the caterer was fantastic. There was this little hippie gal. Remember, this was 76. And she called herself Mother Moon. And Mother Moon laid out a beautiful table of all organic food. And I mean, she was kind of yeah, ahead of her time, really, you know. That hadn't really caught on with places like Whole Foods Market and that we have in America now, where you go and you get organic this and wonderful bean sprouts and this. And this little hippie lady with her beautiful, sweet little voice would put out all this strange food. You know, I'm looking at, you know, at that age, I think, God, I could really go for a hot dog, but <laughs> I guess I'll have this uh, bean porridge instead. So that was most unusual, and it was part of the whole eccentric, uh, you know, experience of the film in its entirety. Co-writer, producer, Marty Rustam. Toby wanted that feeling of the South. He wanted to make sure everything relates to sloppiness or the hotel owner who doesn't care about the hotel. All he cares about is his own alligator and getting, you know, killing people. And uh, so if you look at it individually, they all kind of weird character, and then all of a sudden you have different character opposites of all Mel Ferrer and his daughter, you know, come into the picture. And if you go to the nightclub, uh, it's, it's part of the South, and the minute some, somebody says something, they all of a sudden they want to have a brawl, they want to have a fight, you know. Yeah, she was very good. I, we were very, I really was pleased with everybody. The budget of the film was, uh, penciled out to be 620,000, but we came below that. I believe it came a little over 520, and we saved some money. And uh, This is the only film, by the way, the only horror picture that have won an award in London Film Festival. But they showed it at the festival, and they gave it the biggest award. I think that's the only award was given to any horror picture, and that's the only award uh, Toby ever received uh, and in the horror f category. Makeup artist, Craig Reardon. Toby was always the sweetest person. He had uh, an interesting uh, <laughs> uh, 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 liking for uh, I remember he liked to drink Pepsi, and he liked a uh, he liked to keep uh, a jar of jalapeno peppers nearby, a real Texan, and he'd eat these goddamn jalapeno peppers and chase it with Pepsi Cola, his poor stomach, plus smoking stogies, you know. Well, you know, I mean genetics, right? I mean he obviously had the stomach for it, and uh, he has he has a wonderful drawling way. It's kind of talks in a way. He says, "Well, man, I think that." You like that. And you've got to kind of lean in to catch, you know, what Toby's uh, on to say there. And uh, sometimes he doesn't articulate absolutely clearly what it is that he wants to uh, do, but you get the idea, and often when he has an idea, it's marvelous. I'll, I'll give you an example, one I think I remember not so much of eating alive, but I remember very clearly when we were talking about some of the things in Poltergeist, he had the most marvelous idea. Unfortunately, we were not able to do it. Uh, of a specter, a kind of a ghost or a horrible thing that you would see in this uh, suburban house. And he said, you know, he says, you know those little pills you get at the uh, Fourth of July? And, uh, you know, I'm doing a bad Toby, forgive me, Toby, but, but it's part of his flavor as a person. Uh, you know, and you light them and they, they kind of, it's like a, like a snake grows out of them. He says, it would be great if you had, you know, that for the body of this thing. And, you know, I thought, God damn it. That's great. That is great. That would be horrific. You know, just kind of coming, 
with the weird eccentric, you know, almost, you know, disgorging quality that that would have with some, you know, obviously with some sort of frightful, you know, head at the, at the top of it. And that's how Toby thought. He had wonderful imagery in his mind. Uh, in other respects, he was a little diffuse, and so, you know, uh, there, was, there were difficulties for Poltergeist, which I don't need to go into in this context. But uh, Toby was very sweet. I remember one day on the set, he said he had just seen uh, Alfred Hitchcock's latest picture. Uh, that, that dates me and Toby. He says, I think he's kind of, you know, he's kind of lost it. <laughs> he was talking about family plot. You know, I mean, Hitchcock was obviously one of the titans of the business. And, uh, you know, even at the time, I thought, who is this guy? Who's this guy putting down Hitchcock, you know? But, you know, he, he was a young, you know, uh, up-and-coming uh, young Turk, and, you know, he had every right to have an opinion uh, about Hitchcock. And, uh, you know, obviously he had, a, had, had great ambitions for his own uh, future in film. Who doesn't? Actress Kyle Richards. I was basically just tormented the entire shoot. I definitely remember this. I remember thinking, why was everything so dirty? Everything, everything's, the walls, you know, it looked like the whole thing was gonna come crumbling down. Daddy! Daddy! Oh my gosh. <laughs> I think this is one of the scariest films I've ever seen. Forgetting the scariest film that I've ever been in but the scariest film I've ever seen. It's really freaky. And the, oh yeah, and I, oh, you know, you're sitting there having lunch and everybody's got blood dripping all over their bodies. It's really upsetting sometimes too. <laughs> oh my God, that, is that me hanging upside down? Wait, was that, I'm having, that really is me hanging. I remember that I really was hanging. Where were the child labor law people? <laughs> Isn't that considered a stunt? <laughs> See, I never remember being a stunt woman. Now I do remember hanging like that. They, they used my brace to hook me on there. I remember, oh, the frustration of having to be doing that noise the whole time, that whining and the crying. You, you couldn't stop, it was nonstop, and then cut, start, action, cut, action. I just did it all day long. I think I sound a little tired of doing it. <laughs> well, there he goes. This stage was so frightening. I mean, even being there as a little girl was so scary to me. It was very, the lighting with the, glow and the smoke was so scary look at that look at that see look at the size that is that was not Mammy right there the hair is darker they just let me do the hanging upside down then the getting down to get somebody else <laughs> co-writer producer marty rustam this is uh, kyla she was very good and uh, the i didn't know at that time you know but uh, when we hired they said that they only worked a few hours a day because of then they had the school teacher with them, and but she was very good. She was a what an imagination, huh? Those writers like Jim Clift and the Toby and the characters, the stars. I thank them all for a good movie. I haven't seen it, but like I said, in a long time. But uh, I think uh, the crew, you know, once uh, Robert Kalanikun jumped on the end as a cameraman, I think. That and he was uh, fast, and by being fast in his work, it in, indirectly demanded the others to be as fast as he is so they could set up. And while he's setting up, as soon as he finished, finished he said, don't forget, the next setup, I want him to be ready. You know, he was very demanding, he was really. And uh, I said, well, why do you go so fast? You know, you, usually most cameramen want to stay like you say, I want to get out of here. <laughs> he did a good job. They all did a good job, really. So looking at back, you know, at the time, you under pressure and uh, find out which way the film is going to go, how we're going to 
pays back your investors, how you're gonna do this and that, you know. A lot of things on the line, your name is on the line, your reputation, and now I look at back, I think uh, I give credit to all of them. They really did, uh, they did a good job based on what we had to work with. But I think it's a unique picture, and this film, I think, at the, the timing may be, uh, could have been wrong because it came right around Jaws, you know, but, uh, and the title, whatever. But it's still, if this picture comes out as, a, as it is, I think it will do much better than a lot of other horror movies because it has characters and you have uh, the horror and you have the intensity. And if it is remade or made the uh, sequel, I think it will do very, very well, frankly. Thank you.